What better starting point for our story of this bustling, busy ancient town than the Horn Church, St. Andrew's, the parish church whose tall green spire is a landmark for miles around, and has served, so it is said, as a guide for Thames navigators for hundreds of years. For 800 years a church has occupied this spot, and from the 120-foot high tower we can pick out most of the boundaries of the modern sprawling town that our Horn Church has become. Westward lies Romford, our nearest neighbour. Northward to Brentwood and the wooded slopes of Warley. To the east, the Langdon Hills rise gently in the distance. And beyond is South End and the low-lying Essex coast. Southwards is the Thames, that broad, sluggish, yet life-giving artery of English commerce. It was along this age-old highway that the Saxons first travelled, and came ashore at Raynham, maybe to rest, maybe to gather wood, or to find water over a thousand years ago. Raynham Creek still has that deserted air that must have met those ancient chieftains. The river mist and smoke from the waterside factories add to its illusion of desolation. Many traces of Saxon habitation have been found in this vicinity, the most notable of which is the Saxon drinking horn exhibited at the South Bank Exhibition of 1951. Some of the old manor houses still remain, but not all, for of some only traces remain, living in memory as place names and folk names for old landmarks. Nelms Manor is probably the most notable and is still lived in by the eminent J.P. Mrs. Platford. A grand old house this, still redolent of sighs and sickle days in the mellow, unhurried peace of a bygone age. Breton's Farm is another of these manor houses. The heavy wrought iron gates are typical of the craftsmanship that flourished in those far-off days. Upminster Hall, known to most as Upminster Golf Club, has a rambling beauty that shows at its best in the setting of age-old oak. Less known, probably, is Cranham Hall, square-fronted and defiant towards the eastern winds, looking out over its rolling meadows with stern, unrelenting face, watching the rich crop of sweet hay being reaped to help feed its herds of dairy cattle and woolly sheep. Gradually, the system of dividing up the countryside into manorial kingdoms gave place to the method of using the parish as a unit. The parish church became the guiding force. 
and the vicar the guiding hand behind local administration. Cranham Church, well positioned on its grassy rise, shows very well the way farms and houses clustered about its foot as if taking strength from its shadow. North Ockenden, half hidden by spreading trees, a fine example of Essex church design. Raynham Church too, looking out over the Thames marshes, exercised its benevolent rule over the old fishing village that long ago stood there. And our own St Andrews, pointing a slim pencil of green to the evening sky, was the focal point of all the local administration up till a century ago. The meandering Ingribon, with its narrow bridge, flows quietly through the meadows south of the church. and a public footpath takes us to Corbett's Tide, a queer island of real old Essex, surrounded by a sea of suburban villas and present-day urgency. Corbett's Tide, the very name conjures up the Essex of 300 years ago, and the smithy, still working, though less busily now, stood there even then. Along Corbett's Tide Road to one of Hornchurch's most well-known landmarks, Upminster Windmill, a smock mill typical of South Essex tradition. Built in 1800, it was used till quite recently for grinding corn. The northern boundaries of Hornchurch are beautiful with their undulating hills clothed with oak and birch. Worley Woods, a favourite spot for all on Sunday afternoons, seems unchanged by the centuries. Modern transport reminds us that the present is with us and Hornchurch has changed and is changing as we go towards its heart. Down the hill again to Ardley Green, crossing the main London South End Arterial Road into Hornchurch in another guise as a planned suburb. Detached, well-designed houses such as these are the ideal of every home lover and Hornchurch has its share in this estate now occupying the spreading acres of the old manor of Great Nelm. Upminster to the east of Hornchurch itself, with its flats for city workers and tree-lined roads, is almost a unit on its own. It has its own shopping centre, almost rivalling Hornchurch itself, with its crowds of shoppers and proud, elegant facades. But what of the people, the citizens of Hornchurch? We have seen where they live and what they live in, but who are they and what do they do? Quite a large number are absorbed by the light industry factories within the area, of which this is a typical example. This is a plastics plant in Ardley Green, turning out all forms of moulded plastic articles, from kitchenware to shirt buttons. Employment in one of our own factories enables the workers to dispense with the long, tiring journey to and from London, for although only 40 minutes from Charing Cross, that 40 minutes adds considerably to the length of a day's work and must inevitably use up much time and energy that could be used more usefully at work or play. But services are good, and frequent steam and electric trains carry hundreds of city workers to and from their London office every day. For Hornchurch is primarily a dormitory area, providing homes for a large part of the army of workers which keeps the wheels of London commerce turning. And to them, 
Hornchurch is home, a place to return to gladly or wearily, to rest or to play at the end of a day spent among the rattle and noise of the city. As an urban district, Hornchurch is administered by a council, a body elected by the townspeople at the local elections held every year, the leader of which is the chairman. Polling day, with all the routine formality dependent upon a secret ballot, is the climax of several weeks' hard-fought electioneering battles, for local government too, these days, is run on a party system. Councillors serve three years, the chairman being elected by the council itself and it is amazing to know that there is no shortage of candidates who are prepared to undertake these onerous and exacting duties as part of their service to the community. Your vote is cast, for better or worse, and cannot be changed or retracted. If your councillor is elected, what are his duties? and to what is he committing himself for the next three years? The council is in open or public session twice per month in the dignified oak-panelled council chamber at Great Langton. This is the seat of a local administration and strict formality is observed. At the first council meeting after the local election, the first item of business is the investiture of the new chairman for the coming year. This is usually the previous year's deputy chairman, and it is a solemn moment as the chain of office is placed about his shoulders, and he assumes the privileges as well as the responsibilities of the first citizen of Hornchurch. With a parting murmur of good wishes, the retiring chairman makes way for the new, who takes up the gavel as a gesture that the council is in formal session to discuss the matters before them. Many an earnest battle of opinion is fought in this chamber, Local problems are discussed and thrashed out. Reforms and even petty grievances are aired and a decision given. And from it all emerges the generally fair and equitable judgments under which we live from day to day. And of course, we cannot think of local government without the rates jumping to mind. A bitter bone of contention, these rates, that levy upon all householders to help pay for the services which the local authority provides. They go up or down, but mostly up, and this bald invitation to share in the expenses of the district is a most depressing missive to receive. We often wonder where the money goes and how it is spent, these pennies, these shillings, these pounds. Yes, where does it go? Now consider, your dustbin must be emptied regularly, your refuse cleared and collected. It is dumped into discarded gravel pits, which, when allowed to settle and covered with soil, will make excellent playing fields. The refuse has to be sorted, and all material fit for salvage removed particularly paper which is baled and sold to help relieve the pressure upon your pocket. Council vehicles and equipment of all kinds must be manned, serviced, repaired and kept in good condition. Sewage must be disposed of, a service of supreme importance in any area. It must be filtered, rendered safe and the clear liquid run off to the river, by then cleaner by far, incidentally, than the Thames water itself. Roads must be maintained, verges and wasteland cleared. The fodder so produced is also sold to keep the rates down as much as possible. Streets are swept and kept clear of litter, either by the well-known crossing sweepers or by the mechanical road sweeper of today. Like the police and some other major services, libraries come from county funds, but this still must come from the total amount you pay to the local authorities. Facilities for sport must be provided, offering opportunities for all to take part, 
and also must be easily accessible from any part of the area. Your money provides parks and pleasure grounds where youngsters can sail their yachts in safety or maybe feed the ducks or swans. Paddling pools to stand or sit in are a source of endless joy to the toddlers. Or shouldn't I have said that? Swings and roundabouts and the helter-skelter. Street lighting, highways, elementary and further education, fire services, clinics, public health services, care of the aged, ambulances, and of course, the men who man them and a thousand and one other things. That's where it goes, you see. That's where it goes. It takes a lot of money to finance these multitudinous services, humble and almost unnoticed as most of them are. It's difficult, we know, but all must do their fair share. We have seen the Hornchurch of the past and the Hornchurch that we know and live in today. But the Hornchurch of the future, what will it be like and who shall say what shape it will take? The authorities' draftsmen work with eyes on the future, setting out on paper and on cloth the form of the new and growing Hornchurch. Dover's estate, one of many such projects, has been planned in every detail in the office and has just been completed. A year or so ago, Dover's farm near the southern boundary of Hornchurch was a wilderness of rough fields and wasteland. An estate was planned and begun, roads were laid out, supplies were delivered, and foundations were dug and set. Gradually the new township within a town took shape. Houses different in form, yet harmonizing one with another, grew from the earth and were finished, watched by thousands of couples who now saw their dream of a house of their own becoming a possibility and maybe a certainty. Rows of houses, streets of houses, Houses within the pockets of most, if not all, of the anxiously waiting couples, and good to look at too, and good to live in. From the south of the area to Hackton, where another large estate was completed a year ago. Hackton Estate, built under greater pressure and with a greater urgency to spur the builders on. With waiting lists of thousands desperate for somewhere to live, prefabricated houses of all types were brought to help house the homeless of the area. These houses, looking raw and new and strange at first, are now beginning to assume the mellowness of weathering, and the gay little gardens and patches of lawn are making these houses into homes. Into these homes are born the England of the future, and it is on the education of our hope for the future that much of our rate money is spent. Modern schools with airy light classrooms act as a focal point on all of these newly planned estates and our children from the age of 5 to 15 have the benefit of first class equipment and buildings and are guided and taught by the best qualified staffs of teachers obtainable anywhere. I never remember in my young days anything like this. Dark, tall, prison-like schools, age-old desks and lowering walls were the schools of my young days. But here, amid light and air, these youngsters learn to live together and make full use of the freedom which is their heritage. The new modern schools are imposing graceful buildings in which the older children learn to take part in the wider issues that will confront them in, lo in longer life. 
the training of mind and body taking their place side by side with the development of craft skill in the well-equipped workshops which are a feature of all these new secondary schools. Recreation too is not forgotten, both for the children and for adults. Many spacious recreation grounds offer boundless opportunities for games and sports of all kinds. Cricket in Upminster Recreation Ground draws an appreciative crowd most Saturdays during the summer. Tennis courts are available to all and are always popular. The newly opened bowling green in Haynes Park gives an opportunity for lovers of this gentle sport to practice their skill on this billiard table carpet of beautiful turf, one of the best in the county. And of course the king of sport, football. In Upminster Recreation Ground and at Harrow Lodge, in dozens of open spaces in the area, the crisp winter sound of leather meeting leather thrills the crowds of spectators who gather regularly to cheer their local team to success, we hope, or to put in a spot of practice now and then. So back to Langton, to the heart of Hornchurch. Langton's, the home of council and of civic pride, looks across the lake much as it did a hundred years ago and will do a hundred years from now. A grand old house typical of its period, solid and four square, to the varying winds of politics, while inside beats the heart of a town, a town very old, yet very new. A town with a past and with a future. A future that depends on you, the people who are the lifeblood and the life of your own town, your Hornchurch.